Well, thank you everybody for joining us here today. Welcome to the Johnson Center, which is the Hoover Institution's outpost here in Washington, D.C. My name is Adam White. I'm a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, and um, also across the river, I'm executive director of the Center for the Study of the Administrative State at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. And this is a nice opportunity where I get to wear both of those hats, um, an area that intersects between the Hoover Institution and uh, the center, namely upcoming issues in regulatory or upcoming regulatory issues and other administrative state issues arising in the courts, especially the Supreme Court in the year to come. Here in this town at this time of year, there's no shortage of previews of upcoming Supreme Court cases and other litigation. But the Supreme Court and the lower courts dockets on administrative law issues and regulatory issues seems to be taking on ever more importance from year to year. And so we thought it deserved a panel of its own. And so I had the, the pleasure of bringing together four of the best possible experts on these subjects to come and offer their views on a variety of other uh, variety of cases arising or, or that could arise in the courts. And I'll introduce the panelists momentarily. But before we begin, I do want to do just a little bit of advertising for upcoming programming. Here at the Hoover Institution, we're going to have a program on October 10th, Tuesday, October 10th, to discuss a new book that comes out next week, I think, called Scalia Speaks. It is a collection of speeches by the late Justice Antonin Scalia. The book was edited by Justice Scalia's son, Christopher, and his former clerk and, and protege, Ed Whalen. And so on October 10th, we'll have a luncheon event to discuss the book with the authors. We'll have complimentary copies of the book to hand out um, and free lunch. Who says there's no such thing as a free lunch? Um, so we hope you'll join us, um, and we hope you'll spread the word, because I think it'll be a fascinating conversation, uh, as will be today. So let me introduce our panelists. I'll go in alphabetical order, although they'll be speaking in slightly different order. Aditya Bamzai is an associate professor of law at the University of Virginia, where he teaches and writes on administrative law, federal courts, and national security law. Before joining Virginia, he served in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel and as an appellate lawyer in the Justice Department's National Lawyer Division, or uh, National Security Division. He clerked for Justice Antonin Scalia and Judge Jeff Sutton of the Sixth Circuit. Uh, next is Jennifer Mascott. Jen is an assistant professor of law at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School, where she teaches and writes on administrative law, constitutional law, and statutory interpretation. She also serves as faculty director of the law school's Supreme Court Clinic and its administrative law clinic. And she serves as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States, and she's of counsel to the firm of Consovoy McCarthy Park. She clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas and Judge Brett Kavanaugh of the DC Circuit. Third is Aaron Nielsen. Aaron is an associate professor of law at Brigham Young University's J. Reuben Clark Law School, where he teaches and writes on administrative law, civil procedure, federal courts, and antitrust. He also serves as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States, and he's of counsel to the firm of Kirkland and Ellis. He clerked for Justice Samuel Alito, Judge Janice Rogers Brown of the DC Circuit, and Judge Jerry Smith of the Fifth Circuit. And I want to add, he contributes regularly to the uh, Yale Journal on Regulations Notice and Comment blog, where every Friday he puts out a, a amusing and insightful summary of the week's uh, D.C. Circuit decisions. If you're interested in administrative law or the D.C. Circuit, it is indispensable. I can't recommend it highly enough. Be sure to check it out. And then finally to my right is Kendall Turner. She's a litigator at the firm of Jenner and Block where she's a member of the Complex Commercial Litigation and Antitrust Practice Groups. Her practice focuses on criminal justice, the environment, and antitrust. Um, and also, Ms. Turner maintains an active pro bono practice, including representation of an individual on death row seeking relief in federal court. She clerked for Justice Stephen Breyer and Judge Merrick Garland of the D.C. Circuit. As you can tell from their biographies. Like I said, it's hard to imagine uh, four more expert panelists, and it's my pleasure to bring them together. We'll begin with Jen um, and then work our way down the line. Um, Jen, would you like to start? Thank you, Adam. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks also to the Hoover Institution and George Mason Center for the Study of the Administrative State for hosting today's event. 
I'm going to start us off with a discussion of a case that the Supreme Court just granted cert in yesterday, Dalmatze versus United States. And this is a case that actually raises a relatively complex set of issues related to the appointments clause in Article II of the Constitution and military judges. And for those of you familiar with the appointments clause, this particular case is going to perhaps uh, be a chance for the Supreme Court to look at the distinction between principal officers and inferior officers and what it means to fall under each of those categories. So to get to the specific facts of the case, the petitioner served in the Air Force and within the military justice system entered a guilty plea that caused her to be dismissed from the Air Force and subjected to one month's confinement. So she appealed the case to the Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals. And the problem that arose there in petitioner's view is that right before the judgment came out from the Court of Criminal Appeals, one of the judges who was serving on the court, Judge Mitchell, Mitchell had been appointed to serve on a second court, the Article I court known as the Court of Military Commission Review. So, so um, and then right after the Court of Criminal Appeals reached its determination, then Judge Mitchell received his official commission for his new appointment to serve on this Article I court. And so the petitioners claiming in the case that Judge Mitchell was unlawfully in violation of a statute and then also unconstitutionally serving on both a military and a civilian court at the same time. Um, the civil office is the position on the Court of Military Commission Review, which was established by the Military Commission Act in 2006. Um, it hears appeals from military commissions, but then decisions issued by the, um, by the CMCR, as it's known, are directly appealable to the D.C. Circuit. And so just to give a little bit broader um, landscape, for more than 100 years, Congress has forbidden individuals from serving as uh, active duty military officers while holding certain civil offices. And so the specific statutory provision relevant here says that unless otherwise authorized by law, an active duty military officer may not hold or exercise the functions of a civil office in the federal government that requires an appointment by the president by and with the advice and consent of the Senate. And so there are two major things the petitioner would have to show here to prevail on the case. First, that being on the CMCR involves a civil office. The petitioner says it does because uh, you're in a civil office if you're in a position that a civilian uh, can hold. That's the case on the CMCR. The government objects to that and says, well, actually, the CMCR is hearing appeals on military commissions, so it's a military office, but the petitioner seems to think has a very strong case there. The more complicated issue perhaps is whether um, the judges um, on the CMCR require appointment by the president with Senate advice and consent. And so as way of background, you know, the appointments clause requires in general that officers be appointed by the president with Senate advice and consent, except for this category of inferior officers, less important officers who can be appointed in alternative ways. And so the question here is, you know, in what category do the judges on the CMCR fall? Um, how are they put on the uh, CMCR? And one of the ways in which judges have been selected to be on the Military Commission Review Court in the past is they can be assigned by the Defense Secretary to this court if they are already serving on military appellate courts. And so in theory, um, under Supreme Court precedent, this kind of model of being appointed as an officer in one place and then getting extra duties could be okay under a case called Weiss. The Supreme Court said in some cases, as long as you have one valid appointment, you can get extra duties. Um, the Supreme Court didn't definitively tell us what um, how closely related the duties need to be, but, but said certainly if they're germane to your original office for which you were validly appointed, um, we think that's okay. And under the Weiss standard, it's likely here that because you're moving from one military-related court to another, the duties would be germane. The wrinkle is that in a concurring opinion in that case, Justice Souter said, well, I want to really point out and make highlight um, the fact that the military judges at issue are inferior officers, and they're being given only new duties that are inferior officer duties, because I'm not so sure that you can switch somebody from inferior officer duties to principal officer duties without sending them through another constitutional constitutional appointment procedure. And so um, how has the Supreme Court defined inferior officers in the past? It said you're an inferior officer if your work is supervised on some level by a superior. Um, and it has explicitly um, 
indicated that the judges on the military side on these courts of criminal appeals are inferior officers because they can be removed without cause and because their decisions are appealable to the court of um, appeals for the armed forces. So on the military side, Judge Mitchell here would be an inferior officer. The question gets a little trickier, though, when he moves over to the civil office side of the Court of Military Commission's review um, because that court doesn't have any direct superior. Decisions uh, are directly appealable to the D.C. Circuit, and members on the court uh, face certain tenure protection. So the court may be asked to sort of clarify and, and, and um, reevaluate here more specifically the principal and the inferior officer dis distinction. There's another wrinkle in that the lower court in hearing the case suggested it was not justiciable because if you remember from the facts at the, at the beginning, um, Judge Mitchell actually had not had his commission to officially be on the CMCR in a principal officer, perhaps principal officer capacity, until after he had finished the ruling and petitioner's case. So perhaps he was not in a position that required Senate consent at the time he, he issued the petitioner's case. But that really, again, gets, gets back to the issue of the principal versus inferior officer distinction, because he had already been assigned um, by the defense secretary to that court the second court at the time of the uh, original decision. And so I think one way or the other, the court's probably going to have to um, look at the principal versus officer distinction, whether it's tied in with justiciability issues or not. On another front, uh, in the lower courts with the appointments clause, so this, this case, uh, Dalmazzi's about the principal versus inferior officer distinction. As you all probably know, um, the court may have a chance to hear this term or sometime soon a case involving an issue then about the distinction between inferior officers versus lower level employees who aren't subject to appointments clause requirements at all. Because within the past 14 months, um, three circuit courts across the country have evaluated the issue of whether administrative law judges are inferior officers versus employees. Two of the courts have concluded in some measure that um, administrative law judges within agencies are inferior officers, the DC circuit, uh, found the opposite, and so in that case, the Lucia case right now, there's a um, cert petition pending before the court, but the government doesn't have to tell us its response, um, what its answer is going to be to that petition until the middle of October. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see if the court um, takes on that issue as well. Well, thanks to uh, Adam and the Hoover Institution for hosting this event, and thanks also to Jen, because uh, the, her um, remarks set up my own perfectly. Um, I will be addressing the likely developments in the year ahead in the constitutional separation of powers that come within the umbrella of administrative law. And if there's one theme that I would impose on the various cases that are bubbling up through our court system, it's the unusual place of non-Article III adjudication and non-Article III courts in our system of government. Those court-like bodies raised three significant questions under the Constitution's separation of powers. First, are the judges who populate them properly appointed under the Appointments Clause? And that's the issue that Jen discussed just a few moments ago. Are they properly appointed? Second, must they and do they act under the direction and supervision of some politically accountable body or individual? And third, are there any limits on the kinds of cases that Congress may transfer from Article III courts to non-Article III courts? So before I begin with the cases and flesh out these questions, a few words on the backdrop. Article III, Section 1 of the Constitution says, quote, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, court end quote, and, and other courts that Congress may establish. The provision naturally raises the following question. Does the Constitution, by vesting the judicial power in Article III in federal courts, which are bodies composed of judges with certain constitutionally required protections, such as life tenure and undiminishable salary, does it prohibit the exercise of what might look like the judicial power by other bodies? So to make the point more concretely, can an executive branch official, quote, adjudicate a dispute between two private parties in a way that binds them and cuts off their right to have the same dispute adjudicated in an Article III court. Now, you might think that seems pretty cut and dry. There's a judicial type process occurring within the executive branch that divests the party of valuable rights. Article III vests the judicial power in Article III courts. 
So, you know, why don't we say that that's unconstitutional? Well, not so fast, not so fast, because historically there have been three exceptions that allow certain kinds of disputes to be adjudicated outside of Article III courts. So first, Congress set up, continues to set up, certain court-like bodies within the federal territories that weren't yet incorporated, aren't yet incorporated as states within the nation. Those bodies adjudicate lawsuits between parties, and they extinguish rights right and left, um, while being composed of judges who don't have Article III's protections for life tenure and against diminution of salary while in office. Second, the second exception, some of you might be familiar with the reality, and Jen touched on this, that in the military justice system, the judges who preside over courts martial, they are not federal judges with Article III's tenure and salary protections. Instead, they're considered to be part of the military system in the executive branch. And that's another exception that's traditionally been recognized, allowing adjudication of courts martial outside the Article III process. Finally, there's a third exception. This is the most nebulous of them all, where a case can be categorized as involving, quote, public rights. Then the court has said that case can be adjudicated within the executive branch. What does that mean exactly? Well, I can't say for sure. Category is nebulous, but what might be thought of as a pretty clear case where you have a public right is a dispute over the conferral of a pension, and that's uh, cases that arose in the 19th century. Uh, that's a public benefit the federal government confers on people, uh, and it was clear that the executive agency that was established to confer pensions in the 19th century for Civil War um, veterans could make decisions about entitlement without an Article III court's blessing. On the other hand, What's not a public right is private disputes over real property. Say you and I have a dispute just about whether one person or the other has uh, a certain boundary that's appropriate. Although there could be some disagreements about that, that's probably going to be thought of as a private right dispute. So if the government tries to take your land, uh, it probably can't do that through some simple adjudicative process within the executive branch. For over two centuries, judges and observers of the legal system have sought to understand how non-Article III courts fit within our constitutional scheme. And the next year, there may be significant developments on this point. So the three significant questions are first, are the judges who populate these courts properly appointed? Second, do they have to be directed by some politically accountable official? Third, are there any limits on the type of issues that they can conclusively resolve? So what are the cases that are arising that address these three issues? So the first, the first case, Jen's already spoken about the SEC administrative law judges. Um, I won't belabor the point with them, but the basic question is, should we characterize the type of work that these judges do, administrative law judges, as significant enough that they are considered officers within the meaning of the Constitution? And if they are officers within the meaning of the Constitution, they must be appointed pursuant to a particular procedure that's set out in the Appointments Clause of the Constitution. And that's the issue. That's the issue that Jen mentioned and that's being addressed in, uh, in these cases. The second issue uh, that uh, is being addressed is about the removal of these types of officers. And I'm going to address that in a bit of a roundabout uh, way because that's the way the court system will as well. Uh, the degree of political accountability that executive officers must have is currently before the en banc D.C. Circuit, the entire D.C. Circuit, in a case called PHH Corporation versus CFPB. And the facts of the case are as follows. The Dodd-Frank Act created a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that's headed by a single director who can't be removed by the president except for certain specified reasons, inefficiency, malfeasance in office, or neglect of duty. And a company that was regulated by the CFPB challenged this provision, saying that it violated what's known as the executive vesting clause, which vests the executive power in the president by stripping him of the authority to oversee the executive branch. A panel of the DC Circuit, in an opinion by Judge Kavanaugh, held that the provision does violate Article II's vesting of the executive power in the president. And the DC Circuit has now taken the case en banc before the entire court. They've heard oral argument, case is pending. So this case involves one of the first constitutional questions ever considered by the framers of the Constitution after the Constitution's adoption in what's known as the decision of 1789. This decision, it's not a judicial opinion. It's not a judicial decision. 
but rather a, quote, decision in the Congress and actually the first significant legislative construction of the Constitution. It occurred before there were any federal judges. The first Judiciary Act is enacted in 1789. So what happens is members of the House of Representatives, they debate while considering a bill to create a new Department of Foreign Affairs, the means of removing or terminating executive officers. And some representatives, they argue that Article II in granting the executive power to the president also vests him with a power to remove executive officers because that's an inherently executive power. Others argue that, hey, the Senate's consent is necessary to appoint officials, so its consent is also necessary to remove officials. Still others, they argue that the Constitution is silent on the topic, so Congress can do whatever they want. They can, actually, they can impose limits or fail to impose limits as they see fit. Finally, there's even a small band of congressmen who argue that the only way to get rid of an executive officer was through impeachment. So James Madison, he's at the debate as a representative from Virginia, and he argues that the Constitution, quote, affirms that the executive power shall be vested in the president, and he further argues that other portions of Article II, they carve out exceptions to the executive power, such as the Senate's participation in appointments, which means that Congress can create no further exceptions. And as he puts it, in this regard, Congress has no right to diminish or modify the president's executive authority. This is the whole question of the president's authority to oversee the executive branch. The end result is that Congress concludes that the Foreign Affairs Act presumes that the Constitution grants the president a power to remove subordinates. And this decision of 1789 has been the subject of a huge number of law review articles, incredible co uh, commentary over the centuries, as well as Supreme Court cases, most famously Myers versus United States in 1926. And in that case, the court decides that the president has the authority to remove subordinate officers, um, which Congress cannot take away. And then Humphrey's executor in 1935 which says that actually what we said nine years ago, it's not quite right, and we don't mean it for officers that could be thought of as quasi-judicial. In deciding the PHH case, the DC Circuit, uh, and perhaps the Supreme Court in a year or a year and a half or so, they'll be writing against the backdrop of these precedents, and one of the main questions at the DC Circuit oral argument that the judges were concerned about was how to reconcile these two cases, how to interpret the term quasi-judicial. And so uh, you can note the connection to the, uh, the, the place. Uh, basically, what's happening here is that they may come up with a holding that says the president has the authority uh, to remove executive officers, but not quasi-judicial officers. That's the way it connects with the, the, um, the theme of uh, my talk. The final case that I'll discuss is a case that's currently before the uh, Supreme Court, Oil States versus Greens Energy. Uh, and the basic point in this case is that the United States Patent and Trademark Office, it grants patents to private parties, including one that it granted to oil states in 2011. Congress, uh, sorry, it granted to oil states. And then in 2011, Congress enacted a statute that allows the PTO to review existing patents and extinguish the rights in an adversarial process before the agency, not before an Article III court, although you get review from the agency. Historically, suits to invalidate patents would have been tried generally before a jury in a court of law. And the question the case poses is whether Article III prohibits moving this type of adversarial process into the PTO rather than in the court system, because the PTO is an executive branch agency. That's the argument that the petitioner in oil states is making, um, that the use of this administrative process to extinguish patents uh, violates the judicial vesting clause in Article III. So what oil states is likely to tell us is whether the Supreme Court conceives of patents as public rights, as I mentioned a few moments ago in my talk, or private rights. Uh, and I, I guess I'll stop right there, and I'll just say that these three cases, they're all about different angles on the same topic, the oldest one in constitutional law, whether the Constitution separation of powers is something that imposes an organizing principle for our federal government, and exactly how. Uh, thank you very much. My mic is flashing, son of a small battery. Um, I do want to add before introducing the next speaker that on the question of the first Congress and the decision of 1789, there was a wonderful book that came out a couple of years ago called The First Congress by Fergus Bordwich. And it's just a wonderful story, among other things, of the first Congress, the, the, the debates the first Congress had 
over constructing the original agencies and then deciding how much power to authorize to grant to them. So it's highly recommended. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Aaron Neal. Sure. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So this is what I'm interested in in the next year to watch in the Supreme Court and in the, the circuit courts. Um, and I'm going to focus on two topics. Uh, one is it's not a secret that uh, the Trump administration has tried to undo a lot of the regulatory actions of the Obama administration. Um, I guarantee you we're going to have litigation about that this next year and the next couple of years as those, as those efforts work their way through the court systems. And number two, uh, I'm interested, though there isn't yet a case that's squarely raising it on the Supreme Court docket, what the Supreme Court's going to do with deference now that we have um, Justice Gorsuch instead of Justice Scalia on the court. Um, so let's, let's go through both of those topics. Um, first, uh, the Trump administration often has very different um, views about regulation than the Obama administration. Um, so what they're trying to do is undo a lot of what the Obama administration did. Um, this has happened in various ways. First, we've seen, this has been a lot in the news, executive orders. Um, the Obama administration did a lot of regulatory things through executive orders, and now President Trump is undoing a lot of those things through executive orders. Uh, for instance, about a month ago, President Trump issued an executive order that undid President Obama, ex explicitly undid President Obama's Executive Order 13688, um, which essentially reinstated a policy of allowing surplus military equipment to go to local law enforcement. Um, that had been the policy before. President Obama said, we're going to make a working group, and we're not going to, to do that the same way anymore. Um, President Trump, you know, the same way that President Obama did, said, I'm going to issue an executive order and undo that other executive order. Um, and we're going to see. So we've seen that. We've seen a fair bit of, of that in the media. Um, also, one of the big events this last year in the world of administrative law was the reemergence, or maybe the emergence of the Congressional Review Act. Um, this is where Congress got involved in the process. So the Congressional Review Act was a law enacted in 1996, which essentially says that after an agency promulgates a major regulation, which is defined as, I think, greater than $100 million in, in effects, um, you have to give notice to Congress. And then Congress has 60 days, if it so chooses, using streamlined procedures to decide whether it approves or disapproves of the regulation. Um, you, there's no filibuster. There's nothing like that. And if Congress approves, um, it goes through the House, it goes through the Senate. Uh, it's like a, it, it is a statute. And then it goes to the president, and the president either vetoes or signs. Um, since um, 1996, before this year, it had the CRA had successfully been used all of once. Um, and that was in 2001. So people thought of it as kind of like this quirky little, you know, crazy uncle in the attic of administrative law <laughs> that nobody worried that much about. Uh, well, this year, that all changed. Um, more than a dozen regulations promulgated at the tail end of the Obama administration have been successfully um, eradicated, uh, pick your verb, um, by, by Congress. Uh, and there's one more that might be, it's unclear, it passed the House, this is the CFPB's um, arbitration rule. It passed the House uh, under the CRA to eliminate it, and it's still pending in the Senate. It's unclear what's going to happen there. Well, it takes a special sort of circumstance for the CRA to, to matter. Uh, why? Because there's a presidential veto waiting at the end. So if it happens, so you need both houses of Congress have to disagree with what the, uh, the administration did, and you have to have a president who won't veto a CRA um, enactment. Well, it takes almost exactly what happened this time, where um, the White House changed parties and Congress remained in the party of the incoming president. So what we've seen here is a lot of CRA activity. There is a case pending in the District of Alaska, which challenges the constitutionality of the CRA. One part of the CRA is not only is the regulation invalid, but the agency cannot promulgate a substantially similar regulation ever again. So it's as if it was a, um, an amendment over the organic statute of the agency. Um, that has been challenged, uh, among other things, as unconstitutional. That's going to be a very difficult case to win. Um, there's a lot of authority, uh, including a pretty good authority in the D.C. Circuit in an analogous context, which says that Congress can uh, make uh, statutory amendments this way. Um, but we're going to see how that plays out. 
um, a lot of regulation. Again, maybe it won't come up again in another 20 years. Who knows? But at least right now, a lot of regulations have been undone through the CRA. Um, and the last thing that I want to focus on, on efforts to undo Obama regulations, is uh, the old-fashioned way of notice and comment rulemaking. Um, if an agency promulgates a regulation through notice and comment rulemaking, the rule is you can't only undo that regulation through another round of notice and comment rulemaking. What we're seeing is as the agencies are trying to undo some of the regulations, sometimes they're staying the regulation. In other words, making the regulation not in effect as they go through that process. Um, so just some background. Um, an agency can undo a rule. Uh, and it doesn't need to come up with necessarily a better reason. They, can't, they don't have to say it's better not to have a rule. Um, all they have to be able to say under a case called Fox Television, FCC v. Fox Television, is that there are good reasons, um, good non-arbitrary reasons consistent with the statute um, for one regulatory, regulatory course as opposed to another. And if they can articulate those sort of reasons, that's fine and you can undo or change regulations. You're not locked in place just because a previous administration acted. Uh, but this takes a long time. It's not easy to go through a round of notice and comment rulemaking. You have to uh, you know, present your data, you have to call for comments, you have to anticipate which way the final rule might end up, um, then you need to respond to comments, and this can take time. So if you want to quickly undo what the past administration has done, um, this, is not, this is not an especially attractive process. Um, so what you're tempted to do is to say, well, let's stay the rule, make the rule not in effect as we go through this process. And a couple of months ago, there was a very important case in the D.C. Circuit um, called Clean Air Council v. Pruitt, where a divided panel said, uh, at least in the EPA context, and when, if EPA wants to stay the rule, that stay itself is final agency action that can be challenged in court. And then the court said, and your efforts to stay this particular rule reg regulating methane uh, was arbitrary and capricious. So your stay is an invalid stay, so the regulation goes into effect now. Um, Judge Brown dissented. Um, the en banc DC circuit denied rehearing. Um, so the question that I'm curious to see is, is this case going to be limited to the EPA context, or is it going to have wider applicability? Um, stays are not unique to EPA. They be, they're extend beyond EPA. Is this case, which is somewhat tied to the statute, an EPA statute, going to just be a new principle of administrative law? Um, I did a quick search yesterday to see how the case has been cited, and it's, it hasn't been cited that many times to see how it's brand new, but there is a case pending in the Fifth Circuit, um, not an EPA case, which was cited for the proposition that if you want to undo a regulation, you have to go through a another full round of notice and comment rulemaking, and the regulation stays in effect at the time. Uh, I'm curious to see how this plays out in the next year. This will be a, a lot of real-world practical significance um, as, as the Obama administration, as the Trump administration tries to undo the actions of the Obama administration. Um, and then the last point I want to talk about, like I said, was deference. And here, there, we don't have a case yet on the court which tees up either the Chevron doctrine or the Seminole Rock slash Hour doctrine. Sem Chevron is agency um, get, receive deference when interp reasonable interpretations of statutes they administer. Uh, Hour slash Seminole Rock agencies receive deference um, for regulations that they administer. Um, but I th the reason I'm curious about this is if you look at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, you know, Justice Scalia to Justice Gorsuch, in many ways, I mean, we don't know for sure, it doesn't look like it's going to necessarily change all that much. Why? Justice Gorsuch um, purports to adopt the same interpretive methodology as Justice Scalia. Um, he praised Justice Scalia. Uh, he was a, you know, openly affectionate of Justice Scalia as a person and as a jurist. Um, so he said, all right. If he kind of thinks the same as Justice Scalia, nothing's really changed um, as, as to where the court is going to be on the big questions. That's not true when it comes to administrative law, uh, and in particular when it comes to Chevron deference. And a case that I would call everyone's attention to is from a few years ago called City of Arlington v. FCC. And you know, it's, it's a rather mundane case about do agencies receive deference when it comes to jurisdictional as opposed to non-jurisdictional statutes. Um, you have to be kind of an admin law nerd um, to spend a lot of time thinking about that question. Um, but in fact, 
it, it divided the court in a way that's meaningful. Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion saying, yes, you get Chevron deference for this too. The difference between jurisdiction and non-jurisdiction is a mirage. Um, so if we're going to have Chevron deference, we're going to have it for all statutes. We're not going to try to draw lines between jurisdiction and non-jurisdiction. Um, that's kind of what administrative law experts expected. That was kind of the status quo before, um, at least a lot in most of the circuits. But here was what the interesting thing about that case. Um, Chief Justice Roberts dissented. And if there's any uh, one admin law opinion in the last you know, 10 years I would urge you to read, I would say read the Chief Justice dissent in the city of Arlington. It's very uh, aggressive in its rhetoric. Um, it's wide sweeping. Um, and he's very concerned about, about administrative law. Here is a, a quote. Um, it would be a bit much to describe modern administrative law as the very definition of tyranny, uh, but the danger posed by the growing power of the administrative state cannot be dismissed. Um, if you start seeing the word tyranny thrown around, even to say it's not tyranny, um, that, that's still a strong rhetoric in a judicial opinion, especially coming from the chief. Well, why do we care about a dissent? We care about a dissent because that dissent was joined by Justices Kennedy and Alito in full. Um, so there's three votes, three votes for that, um, which would pose some very context-specific kind of limits on Chevron deference. We say, OK, well, there's three votes. Well, since then, Justice Thomas, who was in the majority in the city of Arlington, who was with Scalia in the city of Arlington, has completely flipped on this. Not only does he say there should be context limits on, on Chevron, he says the whole thing is unconstitutional. So he has now gone beyond where the chief is um, with Justices Kennedy and Alito. So you say, well, well, there's four there. Now, then we get Justice Gorsuch. If Justice Gorsuch is either in the chief camp or the Scalia or the um, Thomas camp, well, there, there, there might be five votes there. And the question is, what are they going to do? Uh, my sense, as someone who watches the court, is that the chief um, is not inclined to overrule things. That's not really how he likes to do it. And if he does overrule, um, it takes a lot of time, and it's, it's a kind of careful process. They don't overrule a lot of cases. But what the chief is more inclined to do is to limit cases. Um, so some of the context-specific limits that he talked about in City of Arlington dissent, I can imagine some of those coming in. And King v. Burwell, he added um, a major questions kind of limits on Chevron. I can see five votes, at least a plurality, that say we're going to add context-specific limits and one or two who say all of this is bunk. Um, but that's five working votes for the idea that we need to have more limits on this sort of thing. Likewise, our deference, um, before Justice Scalia passed away, there are a lot of sophisticated Supreme Court litigants were trying to bring that cert petition because Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas and a little bit Justice Alito and even a, a bit Justice Chief Justice Roberts had expressed some misgivings about this. Um, now that we have um, the full court again, all nine, I imagine we're going to see more of those efforts. I know that Jen's center over or, or clinic at George Mason has a pending petition on our deference. There will be others as well. So that's something also to keep your eyes on. Great. Thank you. And just to reiterate, Jen has the clinic. I have the center. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is very distinct. Um, I do want to say briefly on on Roberts and City of Arlington and the point you raised, there's two things I love about that opinion. One is when he used the tyranny line, that was a poke at Scalia, right? Because it was, it was a poke at Scalia's use of the tyranny phrase in the hour deference cases where Scalia was quoting what Federalist 49, I think, or something. And so that was a, like a funny poke by Roberts. But in addition, in some ways, Roberts's approach in City of Arlington, you know, a couple years later, he rearranges it a little bit and applies it in the King v. Burwell case with a much different coalition. I want to return to the Chevron and, mm -hmm. and Chevron Step Zero issues in a bit. Uh, but first, uh, I want to welcome our fourth speaker, Kendall. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here. I know it's Friday. And um, I share my co-panelists' view that this is a very interesting time in administrative law, um, which generally is not the most riveting of topics for most people. Uh, just I clerked for Justice Breyer, as you heard. And there's a story, which is probably apocryphal. but. Uh, he was teaching administrative law at Harvard, and he, you know, at the end of the term, you hand out course evaluations, and um, one of the course evaluations said, if I had only one hour left to live, I would like to spend it in, in Professor Breyer's administrative law class. 
and he thought that was very nice. And he flipped the paper over and it said, because an hour in that class feels like an eternity. <laughs> uh, so anyway, as I said, I think that um, this is a very interesting time in administrative law. Um, there are probably many other things on which I disagree with my co-panelists, but we will probably get to that in the question session. Um, I think the main reason, main reasons why it is a particularly interesting time is because the sort of stars have aligned both on the court and in Congress and the executive to make it possible to make changes that have been, in, you know, have not been feasible for many years. Um, so I'm not going to focus on upcoming cases, but I'm going to focus on sort of some changes which Aaron had talked about a little bit um, in how the administration is trying to amend regulations and also efforts by both the, um, the American Bar Association and also House and Senate Republicans to amend the Administrative Procedures Act. So on the first point, um, Aaron already mentioned the Congressional Review Act, which, as he said, lay dormant for <laughs> since 2001. Uh, this is the first time that it was used, and the only time it was used, and then it was used 14 plus or minus one, or plus one, possibly, um, since Trump took office. That option is off the table now. Um, as of, I think, May 11th, the Congre that statute can no longer be used to uh, revoke regulations that had been passed during the Obama administration. But um, I think another change in well, two other changes um, in this administration that I find particularly interesting. One, early this year, President Trump passed um, an, or issued an executive order stating that for any regulation that agencies wanted to issue, they needed to identify two that they wanted to revoke. Um, I don't know how feasible that will prove to be, but um, I think it will be an interesting, it's an interesting effort towards deregulation, and I'm curious to see how it works going forward. Um, another is, and this is sort of this is a little bit administrative law and a little bit not. Um, the president's tweets have come up in several cases so far. Um, sometimes an agency will say one thing, and he will say another thing, and courts are trying to reconcile, you know, trying to figure out how to handle that conflict. So, for example, there was the one of the travel ban cases in the Ninth Circuit. Um, the Department of Justice lawyers were trying to make a particular argument about, um, you know, whether the ban was targeted towards countries or certain people, and the president had said something different in a tweet, and the court cited that in its opinion. Um, the DC Circuit has also cited presidential tweets when discussing um, discussing uh, challenges to various executive orders and also um, administrative rulings or regulations. Um, so as to, I mentioned also earlier that there are the ABA has, well, I mentioned that the ABA, the American Bar Association, has proposed um, some amendments to the Administrative Procedures Act. So that, um, you probably know since you are here on Friday, that that was a 1946 law that sort of set the default rules for um, how agencies were going to prom promulgate regulations and how judicial review of those regulations would occur. Um, it hasn't really been amended that much since 1946. There have been, I don't know, roughly a dozen amendments, but most of them have not been very significant. Um, but this ABA proposal, which is a bipartisan proposal, suggests nine different changes. Um, one is to codify the requirement that agencies have to disclose any data, studies, or information that they seek to rely on when they're promulgating a new regulation. Uh, another is to make publicly available the entire record on which they relied in promulgating those regulations. Another is to establish a minimum comment period of 60 days. There's also, it provides a definition of what a rule is, which you would think lawyers would be better at defining over the past, you know, more than half a century, but um, it's taken a lot of work, and this would probably also create problems, but there is at least a proposal to define what a rule is. Uh, then there's also a prohibition on so-called, like, Cinderella rules, um, so, which is to say, like, oftentimes, as Aaron, I think, alluded to, at the end of an administration, there will be a sort of rush of regulations that are passed. Um, and the Congressional Review Act is one mechanism to allow the new administration to sort of review them and revoke them if they see fit. The proposal here would also allow regulations um, a certain amount of time after the new administration took office. They wouldn't go into effect for a certain amount of time um, and would allow the new administration to sort of review the evidence on which the agencies had relied in promulgating those regulations. Um, 
I think someone else, I'm not, I don't remember which person talked about um, sort of, there's this kind of fiction when new administrations take office that, you know, they often reverse their rules. And there is this requirement that they nevertheless have a reasoned basis for doing so. Um, and courts sort of, you know, like know that there is another reason that this change is happening, but there is still this requirement that they have an adequate uh, basis. Uh, there are four other changes, which I'll mention briefly. One is that um, agencies have to establish a plan for sort of retrospective review. So a plan for whenever they issue a new rule, there has to be a plan for how they're going to evaluate the efficacy of that rule. And they have to publish that plan. Uh, and they also, the next requirement, is they have to publish their general regulatory agenda. Um, last two, one is that the ABA wants to repeal the exemption of, so the certain types of rules are exempt from what's called notice and comment. Um, these are like rule regulations pertaining to public loans. Um, there's also narrow exemptions for public property and for military and foreign affairs. Um, and it wants, the ABA wants to si significantly limit that exemption. And the last uh, change the ABA wants to make is to limit um, interim final rulemaking. So there are exemptions for types of rules that don't, or there are times when agencies can claim that their rules don't have to go through notice and comment rulemaking. And the use of that exemption has increased dramatically uh, in recent years. And uh, the ABA wants to sort of put the lid on that again. Um, so that's the ABA's proposal. And the first seven that I mentioned have been worked into um, a bill which has passed the House but is now has not passed the Senate um, called the Regulatory Accountability Act. Um, so it passed the it passed the House with actually five Democrats supporting it, um, and as I said, the Senate hasn't passed it yet. But they but it incorporates essentially all of these recommendations. Um, so I'll be curious to see what happens. Um, and then I just wanted to mention just sort of building off of what Aaron said about um, the sort of changes in the court and what that means. Um, there was a case last term where everyone thought it was called, um, I'm going to butcher this name because I don't, I'm terrible at Spanish, um, but I believe that it's Esquivel Quintana. Can you guys confirm? <laughs> Great. Anyway, um, people were really interested in that case because they, the petitioners had asked the court to reconsider Chevron deference, um, and the decision was 8-0. Thomas wrote it, Justice Thomas wrote it, and they said, you know, in this case, like, the agency's interpretation is so clearly wrong that we're not going to address that issue because it's not squarely presented. Um, and I think that's interesting because I agree with Aaron that there are many people on the court who would be interested in taking up that question. Um, but I think that last term there was a really big effort to sort of present a unified court when it was going through a very difficult time. And so I think that there might have been more reluctance to sort of take on that big fish then. And there, that might be not as true now. In particular, going to Aaron's point about, um, about um, Justice Gorsuch, he, he has many uh, well-known opinions from when he was in the Tenth Circuit, some of them concurring, some of them dissenting, um, about his desire, his belief that Chevron deference is inconsistent with separation of powers. Um, so, assuming he has not switched his views since 2015, uh, I think that this term might really bring some change in the same way that changes in Congress might bring some change to the Administrative Procedures Act. Well, thank you. Um, on the ABA report, by the way, I just want to note that Naomi Rao, a law professor at George Mason University and the founder of the center I run, she was on that ABA committee when we issued that report. I was on the committee, too. And when uh, Professor Rao was nominated for the post she now occupies, uh, head of OIRA at the White House, the regulatory oversight body at the White House, um, a progressive group issued a report criticizing her, and it criticized her for the ABA report. And it was the first time in, in my lifetime I'd ever seen the ABA criticize a sort of a reactionary right-wing body. Um, um, the, the first time I'd seen a conservative attack for participating in it. Um, but anyway, thank you all very much for those comments, all very thoughtful. I have plenty of questions. Before we get to those, I'd, be, I'd love to hear any thoughts any of you have on what's already been raised. Um, I mean, in no particular order, if anybody's chomping at the bit to react to anything, um, by all means. Otherwise, I'll just draft Jen and we can go down the line. Aditya, you're, you're leaning into the mic. Well, well I'll, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm 
not actually going to respond to anyone's comments, but rather take that as an invitation to yammer on about something else that I wanted to mention today. So that's what I'm going to do, um, which is that um, I need a buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another uh, very interesting uh, administrative law issue that is uh, currently pending before the courts. And if I'm not mistaken, Kendall, you, are you involved in some of this litigation? So the doctor. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to raise it and flag a couple of administrative law issues because this is the deferred action litigation uh, that's been in the news um, uh, and is uh, um, obviously of, of great importance to many people who are within the country uh, and there are uh, strong views on, on both sides on um, the policy merits of this program. Um, but if you if you leave all that aside and also leave aside various issues that I would I would not think of as administrative law issues, th there are a couple of interesting uh, questions that the litigation will raise that uh, that come within the scope of our discussion today. Um, and just to, to discuss them, I'll just back up a moment and remind everybody what this uh, program is about. Um, and so during the, the um, Obama administration, um, the, uh, the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security formally set out in a couple of memoranda um, a program under which it announced that as a matter of enforcement discretion, um, they would not be taking action against certain individuals who are uh, within the country uh, without appropriate documentation. So they would not be as a matter of enforcement discretion. Now, this might surprise some of you, but um, probably shouldn't if you've ever gone above the speed limit on a highway. But the law is not enforced to its maximal extent uh, in the sense that everybody violates the law. Police officers are not out there catching people who are driving 61 miles an hour in a 60 mile an hour zone. And the question that was posed by these memoranda is, well, OK, so we know. We know that police officers don't enforce the law to the fullest degree. But what if they were to announce prospectively, you know what? We know that the statute says you can't drive above 60 miles an hour. but if you, we're, we're going to tell you in advance, if you drive uh, between 60 and 70 miles an hour, we will simply not enforce it. We're not going to enforce the law as it's written. And there was a question raised about whether that type of announcement should be thought of more as a usage of enforcement discretion, if prospectively they tell you how they're going to use their enforcement discretion, or rather if it should be thought of as uh, some sort of rule that has to go through the procedures that Kendall has, uh, has raised, notice and comment rulemaking under the Administrative Procedure Act. And there's litigation about that toward the end of the Obama administration. So f fast forward to right now, and what we've seen is that the uh, Trump administration has withdrawn those memoranda and said that it will no longer follow um, this program. And uh, the, um, the, uh, the, interesting aspects of the case from an administrative law perspective is, in some ways, the position on whether uh, this type of uh, enforcement discretion should be thought of as something that can be done outside of notice and comment rulemaking or through notice and comment rulemaking, whether that uh, is the case. Uh, the sides have flipped on that in the sense that one of the administrative law arguments um, currently in the uh, case uh, and will be in the case going forward is does the revocation of these memoranda have to go through notice and comment rulemaking? So that's one argument. The second argument that is an administrative law style argument is goes to the reasons that the Trump administration gave when it revoked the memoranda. It said that we think that that type of enforcement discretion, the usage of it, is unlawful. It's unconstitutional, perhaps even. They said it's unlawful. And um, that raises the question whether someone challenging the program can say, well, you know, the only ground in court that you can now, uh, pr uh, you can now um, defend your administrative action on is the ground you announced, and that is that the prior use of enforcement discretion is unlawful. And so court, you have to decide whether the prior use of enforcement discretion is in fact unlawful, and if it's not unlawful, then basically vacate the, the, um, the administration's actions. They go back, and they can decide at some later date whether they will no longer uh, follow the program as a matter of their enforcement discretion. So this goes to the administrative law principle that's captured in the Chenery Doctrine, which essentially says that the administration, when it announces a position, can only defend uh, that policy on the ground that has been uh, 
stated in the administrative process. I'd like to get everybody else's thoughts on this line of litigation, but just one quick question on that, just because it kind of puzzles me. You're saying that if somebody, so the, the Trump administration argues that the original DACA policy was unlawful, therefore we're rescinding it. Somebody else will come and say, no, it wasn't unlawful, meaning, no, it didn't have to, the original policy didn't have to go through notice and comment, right? If somebody challenging the Trump administration wins on that argument, aren't they effectively showing that the repeal doesn't have to go through notice and comment either? I mean, they're arguing, right, that, that or am I getting this wrong? I mean, it seems to me that the two arguments are in tension, right, that, that, or am I, I'm getting this totally wrong, maybe. I'm happy to defer to one of my co-panelists. Well, I, well, it just makes me think of oil states, too, because yeah. if you think that this body is able to grant patents, why shouldn't they be able to yeah. adjudicate? Right. Right. Any, does anybody else have any thoughts on this on this line of cases? Because um, I do think this is one of the, I mean, it's not just the most highly publicized policy dispute in the administration right now, maybe, but it's also probably the richest in terms of administrative law issues or executive power issues that could come up. I'd be but interested in everybody's thoughts. I realize my response is not exactly to your question, which I think, you know, there could be an argument that if you promulgate a policy that people rely on, and if you make continual promises that that policy will remain in, pay, in place for a certain amount of time and people do rely on it, then there might be different procedures that need to, that the rescission needs to go through rather than the promulgation. Anybody else? Or Aditya? Or Jen? Anybody? Right. So um, just a, th a couple of thoughts. So absolutely, um, one of the issues, as Kendall points out, that will be at stake in the litigation is um, in, in terms of the government's ability to um, make certain representations and then change those representations. How, how should we think of the type of reliance interests those might have caused? So that, that'll be at stake in the litigation. Um, but to go back to, to Adam's question, I suppose it, it depends in part on how we interpret, and this will probably be part of the litigation, what the administration meant when it said that the prior policy was unlawful, yeah. um, because it's possible that what they meant, and one would really have to dig into the weeds on this, is that the use of too much enforcement discretion violates what's known as the take care clause of the Constitution, that the president is uh, obligated to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And if that, in fact, is the reason, one could imagine, one could imagine that a reviewing court will say, actually, I, I don't think that that um, uh, use of that enforcement discretion violates the take care clause. So it was constitutional to use enforcement discretion under the DAPA, DACA regime. But um, that doesn't mean you can't change your enforcement discretion policies. It just means that I am telling you that your current action is, uh, is, uh, is unlawful. Your, your view that you don't have the discretion to adopt DACA, DAPA is unlawful. It goes back to you. And then it's conceivable that as a matter of discretion, um, the, uh, the, the administration would adopt the same policy. It's actually something that Aaron has written about, so um, I think it's a rich and interesting topic. Well, I mean, a couple of the big issues that have already been ventilated, but I want to circle back to them, is about agency adjudication um, and then Chevron deference or other forms of deference. Let me actually start with the, with the, with the adjudication issue. And this might be the, the dumbest question of the day, but it's something that occurs to me um, is for Decades upon decades and longer, we've had these debates in the Supreme Court and elsewhere about agencies' adjudication power, right? And I just wonder how much of this is based on just terminology, right? If we didn't call ALJs ALJs, if we didn't call them administrative law judges, these officers in the executive branch, we called them enforcement discretion officers, right? And if we didn't call it agency adjudication, we called it agency enforcement discretion decisions, right? Because that's how I sense, I, that's my sense of what this is, is it's the agency deciding how to, how, to, how, how to use its enforcement discretion going forward at the initial stage. Like, how much of it is really adjudication and how much of it is just bound up in the term? I remember that your old boss in the line item veto case in his dissent saying that the whole court, the entire inquiry into whether the line item veto violated presentment and bicameralism was mistaken because the line item veto wasn't actually a veto. He said this was just a mistake, sort of falling for a terminological head fake. And so when I watch these adjudication cases, I wonder how much of this is just based on premises that this is actually actually is adjudication, 
Um, I mean, that's a dumb question, but Jen, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I'm just going to say, I think one thing that, that happens to, to influence these cases is just the penalties or the decisions maybe that the adjudicator is issuing. So in a lot of these cases, like the SEC ALJ case that was before the D.C. Circuit, I mean, there are judgments coming out that are barring um, individuals from their profession, lifetime bars. And so I think in those cases, you know, it doesn't matter really what you call the process that the decision maker is going through, but if the penalty is to issue a huge fine or a big suspension or uh, terminate somebody's livelihood, it starts to look more like the kind of impact on people that um, the judiciary was set up to um, impose. Okay. And Aaron? Yeah. On that, I mean, one of the foundational cases in this area is called CFTC v. Shore um, from the mid 80s. And there, they were adjudicating the question was can the non Article III um, tribunal adjudicate a common law right? Um, and the court said, sure, but this was a common law contract right. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what you call that, um, that's 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 adjudication. The court says it's fine because it's so integrally related to the to the scheme. But real quick, I just want to make a point. This is something that you know I, I teach, and my students often are more cynical than they should be, and they and they come to idea thinking that all these sorts of cases, especially administrative law, are all political cases. Uh, and one of the things I like about the SEC uh, adjudicate uh, cases so much is. It just shows they're really hard questions, and people are all over the map on these cross ideological lines. So, for instance, the Tenth Circuit's case, which said that the SEC ALJs um, are unconstitutional, how th their manner of appointment, was written by an Obama appointee. Um, and the dissent was by, I think, a, a Clinton or a Carter uh, appointee. And again, so I'm like, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. Even more interesting for me, because I study the DC Circuit is the D.C. Circuit took this case en banc. So you had the entire court to hear the case as whether or not the, how the SEC ALJ are appointed as constitutional. And it split on an evenly divided court. Um, so they issued no opinion, and they just split. But just a moment, you can just do the math. You say, well, you know, there's a lot more appointees that were put on by Democratic presidents and Republican presidents. But yet, nonetheless, it split right down the middle. And I think it's important when people Whenever I get a chance, I'd like to make sure people know this. Um, these are judges doing very hard things with very hard concepts. And the idea that you know, the political science model, that you can just map it onto um, ideological priors and you're going to get an answer, I think these cases are pretty strong counter evidence to that um, because that's really just not how the litigation is playing out. You know, one, one D.C. Circuit judge in particular, Harry Edwards, has really pushed back against that narrative and written papers criticizing this idea that it's all political. Um, but in terms of the, the interesting coalitions and, and ideological um, reshuffling in, in these cases, for years and years there was a fascinating debate between your old boss, Justice Breyer, and Justice Scalia over the basic, uh, the, the basic nature of Chevron deference. And for years, if, if anything, in some ways, not always, but in some ways, Justice Breyer was less deferential in the structure than Justice Scalia was. Justice Breyer wanted to create many more exceptions to the Chevron framework, and Scalia said, no, you're, you're ruining this beautiful contraption. Um, or this very, no, that's, that's being, this very straightforward and simple rule that he liked, he thought was a clear rule. Um, but now you have, like I said you know, earlier, in, in City of Arlington, Chief Justice Roberts with an interesting coalition of mostly conservative judges, I guess, and, but then in King v. Burwell, where he says, we're not going to apply Chevron deference. This is too big of an issue. He had your old boss and Ginsburg and the, and, and the, 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 the more liberal judges on. I mean, how do you see this, the Chevron debate playing out practically? I'd be interested, Kendall, in your thoughts and in everybody's thoughts. Um, well, I, think it's, I just think it's hard to know. I think that like, it's the, the Chevron deference is so heavily relied on, and it's very hard to know how adjudicate how decision making would proceed if it were removed yeah. um, and I think like I was saying that I think that if ever changes were going to be made the stars are aligned right now both yeah. because of the makeup of the court and because of the changing of positions that Aaron discussed um, I of course am biased um, probably because of working for my boss I think he has a lot of faith in administrative agencies um, and I because I clerked on the D.C. Circuit and then I clerked on the Supreme Court and I worked on many administrative law cases. And I, like, I think I'm pretty smart, but like, agencies are very smart and they're experts and I'm not an expert. Mm 
Um, and I understand the argument that this, the Chevron deference sort of corrupts the separation of powers, um, but I think pragmatically, as my old boss thinks, uh, that it would be very difficult to get anything done without some type of deference along the lines of Chevron. And does anybody on the panel think that there's more, that there's a non-zero chance that in, 20, in the next 20 years the Supreme Court could just, re, just repudiate Chevron altogether? Or is it just going to be a steady debate over exceptions and limitations and the ways you apply it? I mean, is there any chance that the court's going to say we're, we're done with Chevron? Does anybody think that, let me, put it, let me put it this way, yes or no, does anybody think there is a chance that, that it could be overturned? You know, obviously, if I could make predictions like that with any degree of accuracy, I would have a much better paying job than I, I currently do. But um, so, you know, one of the, um, one of the, uh, the, one might say benefits or appealing qualities of Chevron, um, and uh, Justice Scalia used to say this uh, uh, and had said it in a Law Review article, um, is that as opposed to the regime that came before it, um, which is the regime of whether an agency got deference and under what circumstances from, say, about the 1950s to 1984. Um, it was much more rule-like and easy to apply, and therefore, that's one of the reasons why he liked it. You know, it was predictable. It was the type of thing that everybody could organize their affairs around. Um, and I do have a sense, I do have a sense uh, it's the same sense that Aaron has, um, as he uh, mentioned in his introductory remarks, that uh, at least in the short term, the coalition is there for what might be described as short-term cutbacks on the doctrine in various marginal cases. And the question arises at that point, um, you know, once you have five years or a decade of cutbacks, what's left of the simple rule-like doctrine that once existed? and should we continue to call it the Chevron doctrine? Isn't it actually some other doctrine that's different from the two-step process, um, which if there are enough exceptions that are created to it, uh, would no longer be an accurate statement of the law? Yeah. So I, 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 I don't think that we will ever, uh, and in fact, if you look back at history, the notion of deference to interpretation has been with the Republic since the Republic's founding, it's just the circumstances have been uh, different and the, the times in which deference was applied um, are, are quite different from how we apply it now. Um, I don't think we'll get rid of that concept as a general matter, but I kind of think that if in five or ten years we're looking at the old two-step Chevron process and 15 exceptions, one should question whether we should even start with the two-step Chevron process. Right. Uh, Chen, did you have a thought? Well, I was going to say, I mean, I do think that there's a chance, as, and similar to what Aditya is saying, that Chevron, at least as, as we know it, or how it's been applied, could be, um, that the court could make statements suggesting that it does not think that that regime as we know it now is, is appropriate. But I think, um, I think they might get rid of Chevron in the narrow, narrower cases of where it's purely a legal or statutory interpretation decision. So I think now, I mean, at least my sense uh, before studying administrative law a lot or my students' sense, I think, is that everybody knows the word Chevron and they just have this general idea that it means to defer to agencies. And so there's this fear that if we get rid of Chevron deference, then agencies can't do what they're supposed to do. They can't policy make. They can't be experts. They can't make decisions. And I think, um, that, to me, is where the arbitrary and capricious review steps in with the APA. I think sometimes we've sort of let Chevron glom on to issues of law and then also think about it with issues of policy, and I think there might just need to be a better parsing out. No, there's no Chevron deference for straight-up statutory interpretation questions, but if the statute's really um, using a broad term or intending to delegate policy authority, then you're under the arbitrary and capricious analysis of the APA, and that that deference, you know, would still be in place. We're just not going to have um, agencies do purely um, legal interpretation under this Chevron guise anymore. Great. Um, I, Aaron, please. Sure. Um, just, just two quick points. Uh, one thing I, I should have mentioned before in my opening remarks is the city of Arlington case is interesting for another aspect, and that is Justice Breyer also concurred. He ends up not on the dissent side of the line, but on the concurrence side of the line. But he also would have proposed his own analysis, which is more context-specific limits on deference. So it's possible 
again, I'm not sure how that plays out because his views don't always map on to anybody else's. Uh, he approaches these things in his own way. But we might end up with something different still that we haven't really even talked about because there's another voice who's very knowledgeable who's been thinking about this for a long time. Yeah. Another point I want to make real fast, to go back to the D.C. Circuit, there was a very fascinating concurrence from a few, I guess this is back in May, um, from Judge Silberman, Judge Larry Silberman. Um, Judge Silberman uh, is one of the, um, the old guard, um, but one of the early champions of Chevron. Um, back on the D.C. Circuit, uh, he wrote a law review article explaining why this was a really good thing. And like Justice Scalia, th they were very close. Uh, and he, the concurrence is very interesting because he says, no, 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 we should keep Chevron. Chevron two-step is the right way to approach this. But the real work shouldn't be getting rid of Chevron. It should be at step two of Chevron. Um, once we say there's ambiguity, that doesn't just mean the agency should win. Instead, we should have a more uh, aggressive step two to make sure that the agency policy choices really are at least consistent with the general thrust of the statute and not just a license to go off and do what you want to do. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that, um, but it, it was interesting. It was. And that's, it, a, that's like the hard look doctrine. Correct, yeah, correct. Yeah. It's, it's like the hard look doctrine with more in, in the step two space. Right, right. And I think, I'm not sure what, he, what he's doing the, that. My sense is that Judge Silverman is hoping that the justices read that. Um, I think that's who he's writing to. So again, I'm not sure how that all plays out. There's a whole bunch of things in the water and how it all mixes, we will see. Isn't that just though, almost the mirror image of, the, of Scalia's original approach, which was be tough at step one and very open at step two? I mean, he could be tough at step two, like in the utility or regulatory group case a couple years ago. But Scalia's sort of original defense of Chevron was, I'll be very rigorous at step one and very generous at step two. So it's, am I understanding the, your Silberman approach? Yes, that's what I think Judge Silberman is trying to say. Hey, maybe there's some, yeah. some wisdom still to be had in that. Yeah. Well, I will say, um, and please, if anybody has questions, raise your hand and we'll send mics around. Uh, anybody? Let's start here and then the second one will be in the back. But as, as the microphones are making their way over, um, three things definitely worth reading. One is a ditch's paper on the origins of Chevron deference published about a year ago in the Yale Law Journal, Virginia Law Review, Yale Law Journal, Yale Law Journal. Uh, and then two uh, important classics on this. One that Ditcher referred to is Scalia's uh, article in the 1989 Duke Law Journal on Chevron. But then a few years older than that, your boss in the Administrative Law Review, right? He wrote this classic um, sort of, it was in 19, 1984 or 85, uh, Justice Breyer, then still a judge on the First Circuit, wrote a very thoughtful article on the then sort of nascent state of, of judicial deference in its modern form. So all three of those are highly recommended. Yeah, we'll and, and Judge Silberman in 1990 and, and George Washington had another one of the, the basic ones. Our cup runneth over. Um, right here, uh, sir, and then, and then in the background it will be next. Hey, guys, thanks for, uh, thanks for everything here today. Going back to uh, the Congressional Review Act, I was wondering what you all think about the uh, theory put forward by the Pacific Legal Foundation and Todd Gaziana, who is one of the staffers who helped write CRA, that uh, CRA requires agencies to transmit a final report on new uh, rules. And if, uh, uh, and if the, they don't do that, then the, the 60 legislative day countdown in CRA doesn't apply. And they have said that uh, there are dozens of hundreds of rules in the past 20 years in which that was not properly done, meaning Congress could go back and pass binding resolutions of disapproval for rules that have been there for 5, 10, 15 years. Uh, do you think that, to the extent, if you're familiar with this argument, that they are uh, interpreting the um, statute correctly in making this argument? And then are there any federal judges out there that would agree with them? Now, I thought of this question, uh, Kendall, when you said that the CRA is now basically off the table, that there is the Pacific Legal Foundation's argument that the statute says it has to be reported to Congress. And if I remember correctly, the statute goes beyond just sort of constructive notice that it was in the Federal Register, that it actually has to be like transmitted in some form. I can't remember to Congress. Anybody have any thoughts on this on this argument or theory? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I also was maybe going to bring it up when you had mentioned the date. Um, I don't, I know enough to know that the argument is out there. Um, I don't know enough to know whether I think the argument has legs or not, but I would be very surprised if we don't see some, but I guess the question would be, uh, what's Congress going to do? So it's not like something that, you know, any of us could just bring a lawsuit about. 
Congress would have to say, this is how we want to use our time, is to go through both houses and have it go to the president, and then no court case is, is coming. Is this really what we want to do with our time? And that, so it could be a really inter interesting academic question um, that we never get an answer to unless Congress decides, you know what, we're, we have some time on our hands, so let's, 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 let's take a shot at it. I don't, so in that sense, I don't have a good answer what the court would say to that. But it's not, it's not a, it doesn't strike me as a frivolous argument. Um, but beyond that, I don't have a, I don't have deep analysis. Right. If I remember correctly, I think the CRA says that the rule sh doesn't take effect until it goes to the CRA process. So there is a chance that oh. somebody subject to the rule could be, could actually challenge it. But the more, I think the more interesting scenario is the one where, where, as you say, an agency might start going back and seeing what hasn't been previously reported and then report on popular rules to Congress, knowing that Congress would vote them down, the president would sign it, and then that provision you referred to, yeah. then in theory that agency wouldn't be able to promulgate the rule again. I mean, that would be fascinating to see. Like, the, that's I don't even know what the issues would be at that point, but it would be I, I, I would draw the comment. Yeah. Um, she a, wants to respond to that. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, please. Having lived through this, yeah. once you put it in the, in the register, they've been notified. Congress cannot undo a rulemaking that's been implemented by a full independent agency. If they did, they would micromanage every single issuance that an independent agency makes. It's up to the parties that are affected to litigate if they don't like it. Mm -hmm. And then if Congress, if the independent agency loses, Congress can go back and change the law. Congress can change the law anytime they want, but they, they don't have the right to micromanage the agencies while the process is going on. Well, thank you. Um, and now the next question in the back row, and then right here in the, in the third row. <laughs> uh, Professor Bonsai spoke to the issue of whether uh, the restrictions on the removal of the head of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau uh, are uh, invalid under uh, the Article Two of the Constitution. Let's assume that the Supreme Court holds in an appropriate case that uh, the uh, uh, restrictions are unconstitutional. What effect would that have on the case in which the Supreme Court strikes down the restrictions, what effect would it have on other cases in which the issue is preserved, and what effect would it have on pre-existing regulations issued by the head? I'm afraid I don't have an answer other than we'll see. Uh, so, so in part that's because the, uh, the issue came up uh, in the uh, Free Enterprise Fund versus uh, PCAOB case in which the court invalidated a different, um, dealing with a different agency, a different um, restriction on the president's authority to remove these these officers who are board members of the PCAOB, and um, uh, part of the board, uh, sorry, part of the, the court's analysis uh, was to figure out exactly how it should construe the statute, having determined that was unconstitutional. It conducts this severability analysis, says these provisions are now excised, and the agency can go forward with the remainder of the statutory scheme in place. So one might imagine that the court would do something comparable in that case. And then there could conceivably be fallout in lower cases, uh, lower court cases, uh, on the effect that all of this has had on previous decisions by the director, which could conceivably lead to the question about whether the director can, uh, a new director can ratify the old decisions um, in some sort of, uh, uh, you know, simple way. Um, so all the old decisions presumably are invalid, but can they just be ratified um, to, to, to make them valid going forward? Um, and the additional wrinkle that we have here is that it's quite likely were that to happen that the new director would be a different director than the director whose term is up this year. Uh, and so uh, there's, there's probably going to be a new director and we may not even get to, uh, I, I think that the, the old decisions would be deemed to be unlawful. I mean, the question is whether they would be ratified. Um, we may not uh, get to uh, 
litigation about that because it's conceivable the new director would not ratify some of the old decisions. That's my overall take on it. Anybody else have any thoughts? Well, we'll go here and then in the front row. <clears throat> I was going to say uh, on ratification, I remember that it happened when um, uh, the appointment of Danny Wall from the Federal Home Loan Bank Board to the new Office of Thrift Supervision had been challenged, at least in District of Columbia, and everything, I think, his successor ratified all the decisions, so maybe maybe that mooted it. My question was really, at, uh, where are the ALJ challenges now? Because you said there's a Tenth Circuit case and a split in the D.C. Circuit. So w what's the next step in that one? Jen? So the next step on that is, is that the Lucia petition coming up from the split on Bonk decision is right now before the court. The government has until mid-October to answer that one. What's interesting is there was a deadline today, actually, for the government to decide whether it wants to challenge the decision against it in Bandemir in the Tenth Circuit. And so, as of last night, they had not yet filed uh, a petition for review in that case. So it could be, I mean, if they file a petition for review, then they've got their petition. You've got the Lucia petition. Um, but I think one way or the other, we'll, we'll have a sense on whether the court's going to take this case within the next couple of months. Um, while I'm plugging my panel of scholarship, uh, Jen wrote a, just a terrific paper on ALJs. Is it published yet or is it still in draft form? It's still in draft form. Still in draft form. But it's available online, and it's, it's really great analysis of, of how some of these issues um, are framed up. I, I want to enter the competition for <clears throat> dumbest question of the day. So you have some uh, competition <laughs> I there. accept your challenge. <laughs> uh, I had read a few weeks ago about a drug company that didn't want to have their patent adjudicated, so they assigned it to an Indian tribe. And an Indian tribe is not subject to, I think it was the PTO adjudication, right? So they took it out there and then it could go to the Article Three courts. It, it occurred to me, uh, I know somebody who knows somebody who uh, was involved in getting a new tribe recognized in Northern Virginia in the last year or so. So if I'm faced with an administrative problem and I'd like to get it in the courts, I could talk to my friend and then he could get his buddies who had the uh, tribe established and I'll assign half my rights to that tribe and then I, get, I can eliminate uh, administrative adjudication. Is that something that, uh, or, I mean, you, you tell me which is dumber. Yeah. This is not a question, more of an in interesting investment strategy. Um, does any, any of our panelists have any thoughts on this? I honestly don't know the question or the answer to this. Anybody? Is it you? No, I'm, I'm afraid that I don't uh, either in the sense that um, uh, now that I think about it, your, your question raises a very interesting point, and that is that in the context of this doctrine generally, Article Three adjudication, what are the exceptions to Article Three adjudication? Uh, tribal courts are not the focus of um, the court, and the court just doesn't talk about tribal courts, as I recall in any of the cases, as another type of exception. Uh, so so the, uh, I, I know that your, your question would implicate questions, difficult questions of Indian law, about which uh, I, I'm not familiar. In discussing these ALJ cases, uh, you know, all of these arguments are highly technical and very interesting on a lot of levels, but I'm curious as to what you think of the idea that part of what's animating these technical challenges isn't some growing discomfort in the courts with this notion of having an Article II official decide to charge them with a violation of the law, adjudicate the fact that there has been a violation of the law, and then determine the penalty for violating the law. And then you only get to an Article Three court and out of this sort of unitary executive bucket later and on deference grounds. Do you think there's just some concern about a larger due process point driving some of these technical arguments? And that was what Scalia was getting at with the, the very definition of tyranny line, right, that he borrowed from, from Madison. Anybody? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would call it due. I mean, you could you could think about it with with due process um, as the terminology, or you might just say accountability. I mean, if um, I mean the the idea behind the appointments clause, of course, is just to have a clear um, line between who's selecting the officer, so that there's accountability for there to be excellence in that officer selection. 
So if you have, you know, if you, the, the further you move away from the president's authority to select who's going to serve as an administrative law judge, perhaps you might say the further away you get from democratic accountability. Some of the due process concerns, though, I've heard actually go the other way and suggest that um, if the idea is that we're going to have independent adjudicators, is there a problem if the politically elected president then becomes responsible for their appointment? Um, so I think that's going to be a spot where people may resist wanting there to be a political appointment of ALJs. I mean, my personal thought from having done the historical research on uh, the development of the appointments clause in the first place is that I think that's maybe the wrong way to think about it. That's the wrong accountability structure. Actually, the accountability in the executive branch is all about um, the democratic election of the president. And if we think that there are too many adjudication of, of, of private rights or of people's uh, future going on in administrative agencies, the answer isn't to cut those folks off completely from political accountability or from the judiciary. The answer is just to get the issues more quickly or more frequently before the judiciary itself, and that that's how the due process issues can be addressed. So, so I do agree. I mean, I think uh, with with the question, it is um, it a due process style concern, um, and not to answer the, you know, uh, kind of a, a, a policy question about what's underlying the policy with a technical answer. But there was a time where the the Supreme Court considered and, and debated about whether to properly style this uh, type of objection, and the objection is basically that the administrative uh, branch, the executive branch, is adjudicating issues, and then there's a deferential standard when that is reviewed by a court, and that's taking uh, the stuff that Article Three court should be doing and placing it in the executive branch. There was a time when the Supreme Court characterized that as a due process problem rather than as an Article Three problem. Uh, and so I'm thinking of Murray's Lissy versus Hoboken in the 1850s. Uh, and uh, at, at some point in, in about 1932, I think, Kroll versus Benson, for one reason or the other, uh, and it's, uh, it's explained there in some, some, to some degree, uh, they dropped the language of due process and they adopt the language of Article Three. And um, I mean, I think what the question highlights is that it's not only the scope of these doctrines that is in dispute, but the basis of the doctrines, just the fundamental basis. Should we think of it as a due process problem or an Article Three problem? And in some respects, does that does that matter? Does it matter for waiver purposes? You know, if we think of it as a due process problem or an Article Three problem, uh, and it's not something that they've totally hashed out or settled on. So your general concern, I think, does animate this area, and then there are these technical complications that haven't been completely uh, ironed out. Well, I will say, so the courts haven't answered that, but um, actually at a prior event held by the Center for the Study of the Administrative State last May, Gary Lawson, if you know his scholarship, presented a paper where he is contending, actually, if you look at the history, that the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause didn't really add anything extra than the procedures that were already in place with separation of powers. So that would sort of answer the question that the due process concern actually is the Article Three concern or any constitutional structure concern you might initially think of. So it's an interesting piece to the extent that you're uh, interested in these questions. Called, um, is it taking, taking the Fifth Amendment, please, or something like that, Adam? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, another interesting line of cases that goes to this point that we don't really think of as administrative law cases, but I think the court might think of as administrative law cases, or at least some of them, would be Stern v. Marshall and Wellness, uh, which were bankruptcy adjudications and whether you can have um, non-public rights, um, like, like straight up like counterclaims, uh, adjudicated in a non-Article III tribunal. And the Chief Justice um, got five votes in Stern v. Marshall for the idea that that is not OK. And they had kind of limiting power of the bankruptcy courts. And then a couple of years later, they had wellness come along in which the question was, can you consent to having a bankruptcy court decide one of these things that couldn't be resolved uh, under Stern? And the chief didn't get um, the votes there, so he's in his dissent. And that dissent reads a lot like his city of Arlington dissent, which is interesting. That's why I'm drawing the connection in my mind, is, is the same sort of themes that he hits in both. Um, he said, you know, I, I think he said the court sold its constitutional birthright, um, things of that sort. Again, those are, that's very strong rhetoric, telling me that this is where the chief is particularly focused. So I think that. Yes, I think that the court is worried about 
things that properly should be in Article III courts being taken out of pro uh, an Article III court. I don't think, again, the court is inclined to massively overhaul everything that's come on before. But if the chief can get, um, if, there are, if there is a majority on the court to add some context-specific limits to that, I would imagine the same sort of move that's happening with deference might very well happen there as well. Um, not to keep my friend Mr. Gustafson waiting, but just a question occurred to me inside the last question. Let me just interject it. You know, sometimes these, over history, sometimes these issues are debated in terms of rights or due process. And sometimes they're argued in, in terms of structure, right, and separation of powers. And we just had a very important retirement on the D.C. Circuit, right? Judge Brown, is just, she just retired, I suppose. And she had a lot of dissenting opinions or sometimes majority opinions where it seems to me she was phrasing the issues more in terms of rights and due process, or at least process. Um, and her opinions didn't fare as well at the Supreme Court when they, when they were appealed up to the Supreme Court. Kavanaugh, appointed by the, Judge Kavanaugh, appointed by the same president about the same time, off, he tended to approach these in more structural ways. And we saw it in the, his panel opinion in, in PHH versus CFPB. And his opinions, whether it was in the, 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 the Free Enterprise Fund case or um, you know, a few of the others, they, they seem to have more purchase on the minds of, of a majority of the court. What is it about the structural arguments that seem more appealing or graspable by, to a majority of the court right now than the more rights-focused one? Or am I just overreading this? So, so I'm not sure I entirely agree with the premise. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if uh, the, th there was stark distinction uh, between the kinds of opinions, and perhaps to the degree that there was, it's just the issues that happen to be presented to the judges in specific cases. Yeah. So for example, the PHH case, at the heart of the issue is whether Article II vests the executive power in the president and whether that necessarily means the president has a type of removal authority that can't be limited by Congress. There's no other way to characterize the issue. It's only that way. And to the extent that you wanted to characterize it as about rights, it, you know, that, that could be effective rhetorically or as dressing for the remainder of the opinion. But at the heart of it, it's that type of issue. Um, the question from the audience, what's so interesting about the adjudication question is that you could think of that as either a rights issue, a due process issue, or as an Article III issue. And the court moves over time to think about it as a structural issue. And I have a question whether that's actually the right way to think about it. Uh, well, speaking of just, uh, Judge Brown. Uh, well, I'll, I'll follow on to your question. Um, and we, we've been talking a lot about Supreme Court, but I'm interested in your thoughts on how the shape of the D.C. Circuit will influence administrative law. It's particularly in the absence of Justice Brown, who retired at the end of August, um, and who took a keen interest in, in these issues, not only of separation of powers, but also of deference. Um, and uh, Professor Nielsen, in particular, if you have any thoughts about how her absence will be felt on the court, I'd be interested to hear them. I note that, uh, Professor Bombs, I noted the uh, PHH, the CFPB case is still pending before the en banc court, which is interesting uh, given that the court usually tries to wrap up its uh, calendar before the end of August, which uh, coincides with Judge Brown's retirement. I wonder if anyone has any thoughts about that timing. Sure. Let me, let me say this. And again, I am... I'm sure every time you hear a clerk talk about their former judge, uh, you should discount it a little bit because um, we all we always love our judges. Um, judge Brown is was an amazing judge, um, and how this is this is the part about it that I don't think most people didn't realize is you'd read a Judge Brown opinion and it was a very loud opinion. Um, it was rhetorically very strong, very aggressive. So the idea that a lot of people had about Judge Brown was she must be a very loud and, and imposing figure when she'd walk into a room, when in fact, she was very much an introvert and um, very much a bookworm and was never especially comfortable um, in large groups. She was much, she was happiest with her books. And that, I think, is going to be a loss for the DC Circuit, is um, when you got a Judge Brown opinion it was very much, this is exactly what she thinks. She, she didn't ever hide what, what she thought. But it was based on you know, her reading of the cases, 
but her time in government in California and her uh, you know, 19th century French philosopher and, and Gandhi and Einstein, um, and she was an expert on Lincoln, and all of these things, we go back to, to Chambers and she would talk about a case and she would say, well, I think Kipling put it best and give us a quote that I'd never heard before and I would never hear again. Um, that, that is lost from the court. Um, in terms of how cases actually shake out, um, you know, Greg Katzis has been nominated to replace Judge Brown. Um, you know, I've gone back and looked at the cases that he's argued in the D.C. Circuit. Um, he's very much involved in the big structural cases as well. So I don't think that anybody would say that, that you know, Greg Katzis is not qualified to deal in these deep waters. Um, he's been swimming in them his entire professional life. So, but I think there will be, you know, I'm not saying a, a net loss. I'm not sure. But it'll be different just because nobody is going to approach these cases the way that Judge Brown approached them because her background and personality and her method is so idiosyncratic and so personal to her. So, you know, I, I'm curious to see how the, how the court shakes out without her. Um, I think it'll be in some ways a loss, um, even though I think in other ways, um, you know, Judge Katzis will be a, a, a strong addition to the court. Let me just ask uh, one question to close. Um, we've talked about debates and possible reforms coming out of either the courts or Congress or the executive branch. Um, I know Aditya doesn't like predictions, but let me put everybody on the spot. Um, 20 years from now, as we look back, what do you think will be the biggest change in administrative law coming out of any, any of these parts of government? And, and do you think it'll be a good change or a bad change? I tend to think that it's one that we've already sp spoken about, so I don't have too much more to add. But I think that within, and it's the one that's the most easiest to make predictions about in the sense that various of the justices have already staked out their position and said, here are my views on how the Chevron doctrine ought to operate. Um, so with respect to the other doctrines we've discussed, we would just be writing against a blank slate until we have some body of law from which to make predictions. And um, as Aaron pointed out, uh, there are various justices who have said that the old formal uh, two-step process of Chevron that was taught for so many years, uh, decades in law schools, uh, they, they don't really subscribe to that. And w whether that's Justice Breyer who says that the approach should be more contextual, or uh, perhaps Justice Gorsuch who says that the, uh, and Justice Thomas who say that the notion of deference, at least in some circumstances, is unconstitutional, one can put together a coalition that on a case-by-case -case basis will be cutting back on the doctrine generally. And as I said, once you cut back on the doctrine and you have, you know, the old canonical two-step rule and 15 exceptions, one starts to wonder whether it's worth repeating the old canonical two-step rule in uh, briefs to the court because it's not the rule that they're following. Right. Anybody else have any predictions? Jen? Well, I, I, I think it, whether it's the Regulatory Accountability Act or some other law that we will see the APA perhaps being revisited um, because it has been on the books since, since 1946. And if you look at the various Administrative Procedure Act provisions, I mean, argu arguably on the procedural side, how we're operating now under a structure that's so different at every step of the way. We don't really use the formal procedures at all. The informal notice and comment procedures arguably are much tougher to go through than they should be under the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, administrative agencies seem to have a lot of wiggle room to um, get out from those uh, requirements through the use of interpretive rulemaking or policy making. And I think the courts are going to perhaps or Congress will need to step in and clean up. Um, are we doing too many things outside of statutory procedural requirements in the first place? And maybe, maybe the, the way to address that is just to start again from the ground up and, and, and have legislation on the books that's more an honest picture of what's actually happening than we have now. Okay. Aaron, Kendall? Um, sure. You know, I have a, an article that I published a few years ago in the Georgia Law Review that kind of goes through a lot of the big doctrines and how they've evolved over the last 60 years and how they grow into tension with each other. And I, I think that that's, we're definitely seeing that. We're seeing that the, the old doctrines are being used in ways that maybe they weren't necessarily designed to do. And that how, what, what, what do you do with that? Um, I mean, part of the problem is, um, you know, this isn't a new trend, um, but 
if you if you're a president and you want to make changes in domestic policy and Congress isn't there, if you're not getting legislation passed, um, then you say, well, what can I do with the agencies? What can I do with the delegation that we already have? This is this is Elena Kagan's point um, in her presidential administration article. And once you start seeing that and everybody starts doing the same thing, um, doctrines start to kind of change and how it all shakes out will be interesting. My, the easiest prediction would be something like Aditya's, which is, you know, in the short term, um, there will be limits put on a lot of things, not overruling, not wrecking balls, but, but limits. Um, but the more, the bigger issue, I don't know if the courts can really do, and that would really be APA reform, um, which would come from, from Congress. Whether we can get APA reform, um, that, that's to be seen. Um, and, and, and what that would even look like, um, I think there's still room for a lot of thought as what's the best way to avoid unintended consequences. If you start changing things, it's easy to say, well, this is all going to work until it doesn't. Um, so I think there's still a lot of room for thought on some of these proposals. But short term limits on some of the doctrines, longer term, I think we'll see what Congress does. And Kendall, any last words? Just briefly, so I'm not an optimist as a general matter, but I am an optimist in that I think regardless of how it happens, whether it be these APA reforms that we were talking about, which require agencies to have sort of greater transparency in their decision-making process, or, you know, that Chevron's just eroded through all these exceptions, which are also sort of, you know, enforcing a more hard-look type approach to agency regulations. I think that it will really require agencies to just have even greater technical expertise and to demonstrate, you know, their thought, their decision-making process. Um, so I'm optimistic about uh, agency work in that sense. Well, I do want to say to everybody here and everybody online, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, don't forget the Hoover Institution will have a program on October 10th on the new Scalia Speaks book. But on behalf of both the Hoover Institution and George Mason University Center for the Study of the Administrative State, I want to say thank you so much for all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.